for world peace you all know it already I hope and if you don't you better oh Lord may your hand lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may all be happy may all be peaceful may all be enlightened and cultured may all attain perfection may peace be established in the three bodies of man May peace be established in the three worlds. May peace be established everywhere. May truth be our religion. May service be our worship. May knowledge be our breath. May world be our family. May yoga and meditation be our way. May our eyes see happy and noble things. May our ears hear happy and truthful words. May our tongues be sweet and truthful. May our bodies be divine instruments. May noble thoughts come to us from all corners of the universe. May we never leave God. May God never leave us. Om peace and love. Om peace and health. Om peace and enlightenment. Om. So the topic today is called mindfulness. Hmm. Mindfulness is defined as paying attention, but that's not really mindfulness. Okay. It's paying attention in a particular manner, a specific type of attention. It's paying attention on purpose, to practice. Uh, and it means that you have to pay attention to practice, to be in the present moment, just like a meditation. But we can be in the present moment, but we can't, and if you are mindful, no judgment, no likes, no dislikes. So being mindful is a very difficult thing. <laughs> because everything we experience, we judge. Right? Don't we judge everything? Yep. Yeah. OK. So what do we mean by being in the present moment, in the now moment? The now moment, which is the, the, the only moment you really have, by the way, everything else you're not experiencing now. Isn't that amazing? You're really not experiencing the world. You're not experiencing your yoga. You're none of that. Because the minute you're, whatever you're listening to right now, what I'm saying, you're comparing with something previously. So you have colored glasses on, and, and, and it, does, it isn't what necessarily what I'm saying. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Every, and you compare it to previous experience. So everything I'm saying, everybody's interpreting differently, by the way. Every person is interpreting the present moment in a different manner. So, yeah, you have another, th if you haven't thought about these things. And we compare it to our experience. We compare it to expectations for the future. How are you going to use it in the future? moments. You say that you're studying and reading and you're studying and, um, the material and that you are in a present moment, but whatever you're reading or studying, you begin to compare with what you already know. Right? Don't you? You compare it to what you already know. 
So then you're really not studying, you're really not listening, you're really not absorbing what is being taught if you are in school. Okay. Hopefully, your previous experience will let that go through. Okay. Uh, sometimes people talk to us and we interpret it one way and they didn't mean it that way because of us, uh, the way we feel. Our, allow our mind goes into memory. Other things that affect the moment are our mood at the time. Okay? Yeah. Other things that affect the moment are how the body feels. Mm -hmm. And our likes and dislikes, our attention, our emotional needs, our cultural norms, our thoughts are really not in the moment. So you thought you were in the moment, not according to me. <laughs> okay. So then Karuna, I read this to Karuna, and she, said, she asked me, is anybody ever in the moment? And I said, yes, all the saints are. <laughs> That's about as far as we go. Yeah. But it is important that we strive towards that. It is important that we look at it. We have to look at, at things in our daily life. Most of the repetitive things that we do are done mindlessly, right? And if it's mindless, what happens is if I come in and I mindlessly put my keys down, I can't find them. Okay? Some people have a certain place to put the key. And that becomes mindless after a while. But I have a huge place and that's, uh, yeah. I might put it down because I have to do something over there and then I'll never find it. And they don't have a whistle. You know what they say that from when you multitask and you do three things, you're always going to forget one. So if you walk in and you have groceries, you're on the phone and you have your keys, yeah. you're definitely going to forget one thing where, that, where you put it. Yeah. So during that time, when we do repetitive things, our mind falls into previous thought patterns and the past or rehearsing for the future and reinforce, reinforcing what we used to call grooves in the mind. They're called newer pathways now with the science, okay? We reinforce the newer pathways. Anytime you reinforce, and that's subconscious. We don't, we're not even aware. This is when you're getting up in the morning, your mind goes blah, 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 and you don't even know what it's doing. So you're actually reinforcing what's in your mind without knowing what you're reinforcing. And that's not very good. That's not good at all. Uh, without conscious, the mind will never, the mind cannot stop. It has to think. People think that they can take a meditation and stop the mind. No, meditation means concentrating the mind. And then it will flow in that, within that pattern, okay? The mind cannot stop. It has to think. It has to speak. Okay? So if you're not aware and you think your mind is silent, look again and you will see that it goes through these repetitive patterns of thought patterns that it has created with grooves. And it goes through the same thing over and over. They call it the 12 dozen of uh, thought process that you automatically go through. Okay, like the, so that's autopilot. And so we've, we float. So what we want to do, what you, we want to do is practice mindfulness. And the best time to practice mindfulness is when you're alone first thing in the morning. You get up and you brush your teeth, hopefully. You take a shower and all of those things. And at that time, become aware of every motion. What does the toothpaste feel like, taste like? On each tooth. What does the water feel like running down my back when I'm showering? Or what is the soap like? You start, because you're not being interrupted, probably not, hopefully. In, so you're all by yourself there. 
this is the time. Because if you start the day with this in mind, then if the mind goes into something repetitively that you can't get rid of, know that that's your subconscious mind talking to you. This is how you learn to find what's in there. Subconscious mind, we don't know. It's called subconscious because we are not conscious. But we can become conscious through mindfulness. Okay, that's very, very important. The mind loops and loops in something until it's forcefully distracted. This we must understand. So anytime you are in a autopilot, that's what I call it, autopilot. And many times you're in that, and I'll say to you, you're sitting there, I'll say, what are you thinking? And you go, I don't know. Because you don't know, you're on autopilot. Okay? That autopilot has to be stopped forcefully. It just keeps going until you are moved to do something else. But on, it just keeps going, and that makes a neural pathway stronger and stronger. The more I think of one thing, the more my neural pathway is made stronger, or the groove is made deeper, and everything falls into a deeper groove. We never called it neural pathways 30 years ago. That's new. We called it the grooves. And the mind and whatever you are thinking in your mind is extremely powerful. Thoughts are entities. Thoughts are objects. They're not free. They, you think a thought is free and nobody knows about it. No. Our thoughts travel. And if you're thinking a negative thought, you're affecting a lot of people. If you're thinking a positive thought, you are affecting a lot of people. So the th your thoughts are not your private entity. You have a responsibility with your thoughts. Now, how, when we love something, when you love something, hopefully you love your yoga. <laughs> when you love something, or when we are creative, any creativity requires us to be in the moment. Isn't that wonderful? So how, that is a wonderful way. Creativity is very, very important. The, so we need to endeavor to, to, we need to be engaged in creative things. And especially if you're raising children, you want to create, they're taking that out of the schools now, the creativity. We need to practice creativity. And if you don't have anything to be creative about, create it. <laughs> it's okay, you can. Creativity does not have to be in the arts. It can be in science. It can be in everything else. Creative, uh, what does creativity mean? Thinking outside of the box, bringing new thought into something. Not going with the old pattern, bringing a new entity into that. And remember, creativity also creates. We create with our thoughts. Our thoughts are that powerful. If you knew how powerful your thoughts were, you would never think. <laughs> now, I would like you to close your eyes and just watch your thoughts. No judgment. Just watch. Don't create a thought. Don't remove a thought. Just watch. Good. When we watch thoughts, thoughts begin to slow down. 
that's number one. But when we watch our thoughts without judgment, we realize how much we judge ourselves <laughs> also. And that if you judge yourself for not being perfect, because nobody can possibly be perfect, okay, and that's usually why we judge ourselves, uh, then you create a groove and you steal your energy. You steal energy from yourself if you judge yourself. Did you realize that? Any self-judgment steals energy. It is the worst thing we do to ourselves. The worst critic of you is who? You. <laughs> that doesn't mean you don't look at it, but there is a difference between looking at something and judging something. If you look at it and say, I don't like the way it is, it's not necessarily judgment. That's called discernment. Big difference between the two. Big difference between the two. Same thing we do, do to the children. We don't say that they're bad because they've done something bad. We say, you have done something bad, you're okay. You can change. My parents said, you're bad. <laughs> <laughs> the olden, they didn't know about that, okay? But, so how much, and if we understand that every thought, even if it's just mental chatter, creates a vibration which requires a reaction called karma. Now, every time you criticize yourself, you're going to have a, vi a, a reaction to that, a karmic reaction. Mm. You don't want that. You don't want, OK? Uh, and it, attracts similar vibrations. You heard me say it a thousand times. I mention it every lecture. Our thoughts go out like an infinity sign, pick up what we're thinking, and come right back. I mention it all the time because it's that important to hammer it into your head that whatever you're thinking is going to come right back to you. So if you criticize yourself, then the criticism is going to come back. That the mindfulness that we are aware of mindfulness. You must become aware of your mind. We don't, we don't teach to become aware of the mind in our children. We teach them to learn, to control the mind through learning. Learning is a control of the mind. You're supposed, and now we're even taking that away in the school system. Uh, memorization means that you have to know where you filed it in your mind so that you can retrieve it. But they're not even needing you to memorize anymore. Okay. When you go to India, any Indians here? No. Oh, yeah. Ratan. <laughs> when you go to India, the little kids, you have to sit there very patiently while they call the children in, and the children will recite what they have learned by memory. And sometimes it's a whole ballad of 20 minutes. And you're sitting there, yes, very good, very good, because we want to give them encouragement. Have you ever sat through that? Yeah. <laughs> because it trains the mind. Memory trains the mind, it, it, because you have to file it. You have to put it in a filing cabinet. When I worked in the office, we had filing cabinets. If you misfiled something, you, it, it took you weeks to find. OK, same thing. What we don't file, we can't remember where we put it. We try to figure out where we put it. We go through all these stages. It is where we So it's a concentration of the mind. It's one of the th concentration of mindfulness. OK? We have 50,000 thoughts a day. That means you have 50,000 reactions of karma per day. And you want to get rid of karma so you don't have to incarnate. Good luck. So what I would like you to do, practice this week, 
When you wake up in the morning, become mindful. When you put the toothpaste on, how does it go on? Don't just smear it on there and put it in your mouth. <laughs> Think about it. Think about doing it. How does that, that toothpaste thing feel in your hand? How does it feel in here? Where are you brushing? In other words, become extremely aware of every action and don't let your mind go away from it. This is how you train the mind to become mindful. The morning is the best time because you're not being interrupted by anybody t talking or whatever. So your bathroom routine should be mindful. When you do that, aha, you're already setting up yourself for the rest of the day to be more mindful. What we practice the first thing in the morning, and in the morning you're still very sleepy, so you're still in an alpha state. So whatever you are practicing first thing in the morning will reflect for the rest of the day. And you're not going to sit to meditate unless you do that routine with the brushing and all of that. Then you sit down to meditate, and you're still in an alpha state. So everything you do at that particular time becomes much more effective. What is an alpha state? It is where your mind is quiet. It hasn't come up to running. It's at how many megahertz per second it is thinking. It goes between 7 and 15. Daytime, it's almost 30. Okay, So the mind is slower. And so you can do it more effectively. When you become mindful of your thoughts, then you be, will be able to discern which thoughts you really want and which ones you can let go. And don't think, and this is what the problem is by not teaching mindfulness, don't think, this is who I am, this is me. There's nothing I can do about it. Wrong. We have total control. If you take the reins in your hand, okay? Don't accept the fact that this is who I am and I can't do anything about it. It's not true. Every single individual has the capacity to change, has the capacity to create what they want in life. Every individual, okay? So, you. We need to, uh, I like to read you, we, we need to uh, understand that chatter. The chatter in our mind with worry, etc., is what gives us the tension. Because with the chatter, we are not looking at it and being able to make a change. It's just in there repeating constantly, and that's creating the tension. When you are when you can step out of a situation and look at it without judgment is when you can make a change, right? If you have judgment, there can be very little change. You will, you will say, I want to change it, but because of emotions, you don't really know how. When you step out, and usually like, like Donald, you get somebody when two people have a problem and you have a problem, you get a third person in and they look at both sides and they go, okay, this is better because they're totally non-judgmental. Right, Rob? Yeah, so can I ask you a question now? Yeah. yeah. So the difference between discernment and judgment possibly is, is non-attachment to the emotions that come with it? Or Do judgment attach to the emotions? I mean, when, when you judge, you're more in an emotional state. You have attachment right. to emotions, where yeah. discernment, it's, it's less emotional. It's more Correct. Emotional. Attachment is an emotional state. Discernment is uh, you're using your intellect. A big difference. Okay? Yeah. In yoga, we say that the only reason we, are, we are, have problems is because of our attachments. We're still lecturing. I'll give you, yeah. Okay, John Kabat-Zinn lists qualities that are necessary for mindfulness. 
and that's really good. He calls them attitudinal foundations of mindfulness. Acceptance, non-judgment, non-striving, letting go, patience, trust, beginner's mind, and gratitude. Okay. So that's absolutely necessary. It requires us to see what we usually do not see, to feel what we usually do not feel. It requires the mind that wishes to explore the unknown. In the ordinary, we can find the extraordinary. This is the beauty about mindfulness. In the ordinary, you will find new things, the extraordinary. You will begin to appreciate life more. It's amazing, because if you have a certain set of newer pathways, everything in life is the same. You're experiencing everything in the same way because you're repeating the same neural pathways. When you start changing that, all of a sudden new things come in. And you're seeing life, even though it's the same life, you're seeing it in, from a different angle. And that's what mindfulness will do for you. And it's so much better. And then you're also creating what you like. All right? So this practice allows you to look at the present situation, understanding this, this is what it is right now, and then discern if you want to make a change. So mindfulness is very important. It has to be practiced. You're not automatically mindful. Just the opposite. You're automatically on automatic programming. And we think the same way over and over and over and over, and we interpret the situations the same way over and over with the thought process we have. So nothing new can come. And then if you're creating that, you're not creating anything new either. So you need to practice. Okay. So with that, I would like to close, and I want to... Uh, give you a quotation by John Kabat-Zinn. You can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. <laughs> the waves of the mind, but you can learn to surf. And with this, I will have to let you close today's lecture. And oh,